The Three Strangers by Thomas Hardy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Among the few features of agricultural England which retain an appearance but little modified by the lapse of centuries may be reckoned the high, grassy, and furzy downs, coombs, or yew leases, as they are indifferently called, that fill a large area of certain counties in the south and southwest. If any mark of human occupation is met with hereon, it usually takes the form of the solitary cottage of some shepherd. Fifty years ago, such a lonely cottage stood on such a down, and may possibly be standing there now. In spite of its loneliness, however, the spot, by actual measurement, was not more than five miles from a county town. Yet that affected it little. Five miles of irregular upland, during the long, inimical seasons, with their sleets, snows, rains, and mists, afford withdrawing space enough to isolate a Timon or a Nebuchadnezzar, much less in fair weather to please that less repellent tribe, the poets, philosophers, artists, and others who conceive and meditate of pleasant things. Some old earthen camp or barrow, some clump of trees, at least some starved fragment of ancient hedge, is usually taken advantage of in the erection of these forlorn dwellings, but in the present case such a kind of shelter had been disregarded. Higher crow stairs, as the house was called, stood quite detached and undefended. The only reason for its precise situation seemed to be the crossing of two footpaths at right angles hard by, which may have crossed there and thus for a good five hundred years. Hence the house was exposed to the elements on all sides. But though the wind up here blew unmistakably when it did blow, and the rain hit hard whenever it fell, the various weathers of the winter season were not quite so formidable on the coomb as they were imagined to be by dwellers on low ground. The raw rhymes were not so pernicious as in the hollows, and the frosts were scarcely so severe. When the shepherd and his family, who tenanted the house, were pitied for their sufferings from the exposure, they said that, upon the whole, they were less inconvenienced by wuzzes and flames, horses and phlegms, than when they had lived by the stream of a snug neighboring valley. The night of March 28, 1820, was precisely one of the nights that were wont to call forth these expressions of commiseration. The level rain-storm smote walls, slopes, and hedges like the cloth-yard shafts of Senlac and Crecy. Such sheep and outdoor animals as had no shelter stood with their buttocks to the winds, while the tails of little birds trying to roost on some scraggy thorn were blown inside out like umbrellas. The gable end of the cottage was stained with wet, and the eavesdroppings flapped against the wall. Yet never was commiseration for the shepherd more misplaced, for that cheerful rustic was entertaining a large party in glorification of the christening of his second girl. The guests had arrived before the rain began to fall, and they were all now assembled in the chief or living room of the dwelling. A glance into the apartment at eight o'clock on this eventful evening would have resulted in the opinion that it was as cosy and comfortable a nook as could be wished for in boisterous weather. The calling of its inhabitant was proclaimed by a number of highly polished sheep crooks without stems that were hung ornamentally over the fireplace, the curl of each shining crook varying from the antiquated type engraved in the patriarchal pictures of old family Bibles to the most approved fashion of the last local sheep fair. The room was lighted by half a dozen candles, having wicks only a trifle smaller than the grease which enveloped them, in candlesticks that were never used but at high days, holy days, and family feasts. The lights were scattered about the room, 
two of them standing on the chimney-piece. This position of candles was in itself significant. Candles on the chimney-piece always meant a party. On the hearth, in front of a back-brand, to give substance, blazed a fire of thorns that crackled like the laughter of the fool. Nineteen persons were gathered here. Of these, five women, wearing gowns of various bright hues, sat in chairs along the wall. Girls, shy and not shy, filled the window-bench. Four men, including Charlie Jake, the hedge-carpenter, Elijah New, the parish clerk, and John Pitcher, a neighboring dairyman, the shepherd's father-in-law, lulled in the settle. A young man and maid, who were blushing over tentative pour parlez on a life companionship, sat beneath the corner cupboard, and an elderly engaged man of fifty or upward moved restlessly about from spots where his betrothed was not to the spot where she was. Enjoyment was pretty general, and so much the more prevailed in being unhampered by conventional restrictions. Absolute confidence in each other's good opinion begat perfect ease, while the finishing stroke of manner, amounting to a truly princely serenity, was lent to the majority by the absence of any expression or trait denoting that they wished to get on in the world, enlarge their minds, or do any eclipsing thing whatever, which nowadays so generally nips the bloom and bonhomie of all except the two extremes of the social scale. Shepherd Fennel had married well, his wife being a dairyman's daughter from a vale at a distance, who brought fifty guineas in her pocket, and kept them there till they should be required for ministering to the needs of a coming family. This frugal woman had been somewhat exercised as to the character that should be given to the gathering. A sit-still party had its advantages, but an undisturbed position of ease in chairs and settles was apt to lead on the men to such an unconscionable deal of toping that they would sometimes fairly drink the house dry. A dancing party was the alternative. But this, while avoiding the foregoing objection in the score of good drink, had a counterbalancing at disadvantage in the matter of good victuals, the ravenous appetites engendered by the exercise causing immense havoc in the buttery. Shepherdess Fennel fell back upon the intermediate plan of mingling short dances with short periods of talk and singing, so as to hinder any ungovernable rage in either but this scheme was entirely confined to her own gentle mind. The shepherd himself was in the mood to exhibit the most reckless phases of hospitality. The fiddler was a boy of those parts about twelve years of age, who had a wonderful dexterity in jigs and reels, though his fingers were so small and short as to necessitate a constant shifting for the high notes from which he scrambled back to the first position with sounds not of unmixed purity of tone. At seven the shrill tweedledee of this youngster had begun, accompanied by a booming ground bass from Elijah New, the parish clerk, who had thoughtfully brought with him his favorite musical instrument, the serpent. Dancing was instantaneous, Mrs. Fennel privately enjoining the players on no account to let the dance exceed the length of a quarter of an hour. But Elijah and the boy, in the excitement of their position, quite forgot the injunction. Moreover, Oliver Giles, a man of seventeen, one of the dancers, who was enamoured of his partner, a fair girl of thirty-three rolling years, had recklessly handed a new crown-piece to the musicians, as a bribe to keep going as long as they had muscle and wind. Mrs. Fennel, seeing the steam begin to generate on the countenances of her guests, crossed over and touched the fiddler's elbow, and put her hand on the serpent's mouth. But they took no notice, and fearing she might lose her character of genial hostess if she were to interfere too markedly, she retired and sat down helpless. 
and so the dance whizzed on with cumulative fury, the performers moving in their planet-like courses, direct and retrograde, from apogee to perigee, till the hand of the well-kicked clock, at the bottom of the room, had travelled over the circumference of an hour. While these cheerful events were in course of enactment within Fennel's pastoral dwelling, an incident having considerable bearing on the party had occurred in the gloomy night without. Mrs. Fennel's concern about the growing fierceness of the dance corresponded in point of time with the ascent of a human figure to the solitary hill of higher crowstairs from the direction of the distant town. This personage strode on through the rain without a pause, following the little-worn path which, further on in its course, skirted the shepherd's cottage. It was nearly the time of full moon, and on this account, though the sky was lined with a uniform sheet of dripping cloud, ordinary objects out of doors were readily visible. The sad wan light revealed the lonely pedestrian to be a man of supple frame. His gait suggested that he had somewhat passed the period of perfect and instinctive agility, though not so far as to be otherwise than rapid of motion when occasion required. At a rough guess he might have been about forty years of age. He appeared tall, but a recruiting sergeant or other person accustomed to the judging of men's heights by the eye would have discerned that this was chiefly owing to his gauntness, and that he was not more than five feet eight or nine. Notwithstanding the regularity of his tread, there was caution in it, as in that of one who mentally feels his way. And despite the fact that it was not a black coat, nor a dark garment of any sort that he wore, there was something about him which suggested that he naturally belonged to the black-coated tribes of men. His clothes were of fustian, and his boots hobnailed, yet in his progress he showed not the mud-accustomed bearing of hobnailed and fustianed peasantry. By the time that he had arrived abreast of the shepherd's premises, the rain came down, or rather came along, with yet more determined violence. The outskirts of the little settlement partially broke the force of wind and rain, and this induced him to stand still. The most salient of the shepherd's domestic erections was an empty sty at the forward corner of his hedgeless garden, for in these latitudes the principle of masking the homelier features of your establishment by a conventional frontage was unknown. The traveller's eye was attracted to this small building by the pallid shine of the wet slates that covered it. He turned aside, and, finding it empty, stood under the pent roof for shelter. While he stood, the boom of the serpent within the adjacent house, and the lesser strains of the fiddler, reached the spot as an accompaniment to the surging hiss of the flying rain on the sod, its louder beating on the cabbage leaves of the garden, on the eight or ten beehives just discernible by the path, and its dripping from the eaves into a row of buckets and pans that had been placed under the walls of the cottage. For at higher crowstairs, as at all such elevated domiciles, the grand difficulty of housekeeping was an insufficiency of water, and a casual rainfall was utilized by turning out, as catchers, every utensil that the house contained. Some queer stories might be told of the contrivances for economy in suds and dishwaters that are absolutely necessitated in upland habitations during the droughts of summer. But at this season there were no such exigencies. A mere acceptance of what the skies bestowed was sufficient for an abundant store. At last the notes of the serpent ceased, and the house was silent. This cessation of activity aroused the solitary pedestrian from the reverie into which he had elapsed, and emerging from the shed with an apparently new intention, he walked up the path to the house door. Arrived here, his first act was to kneel down on a large stone beside the row of vessels, and to drink a copious draught from one of them. Having quenched his thirst, he rose and lifted his hand to knock. 
but paused with his eye upon the panel. Since the dark surface of the wood revealed absolutely nothing, it was evident that he must be mentally looking through the door, as if he wished to measure thereby all the possibilities that a house of this sort might include, and how they might bear upon the question of his entry. In his indecision he turned and surveyed the scene around. Not a soul was anywhere visible. The garden path stretched downward from his feet, gleaming like the track of a snail. The roof of the little well, mostly dry, the well cover, the top rail of the garden gate, were varnished with the same dull liquid glaze, while far away in the vale a faint whiteness of more than usual extent showed that the rivers were high in the meads. Beyond all this winked a few bleared lamplights through the beating drops, lights that denoted the situation of the county town from which he had appeared to come. The absence of all notes of life in that direction seemed to clinch his intentions, and he knocked at the door. Within a desultory chat had taken the place of movement and musical sound. The hedge carpenter was suggesting a song to the company, which nobody just then was inclined to undertake, so that the knock afforded a not unwelcome diversion. "'Walk in,' said the shepherd, promptly. The latch clicked upward, and out of the night our pedestrian appeared upon the doormat. The shepherd arose, snuffed two of the nearest candles, and turned to look at him. Their light disclosed that the stranger was dark in complexion, and not unprepossessing as to feature. His hat, which for a moment he did not remove, hung low over his eyes, without concealing that they were large, open, and determined, moving with a flash rather than a glance round the room. He seemed pleased with his survey, and, bearing his shaggy head, said in a rich, deep voice, "'The rain is so heavy, friends, that I ask leave to come in and rest a while.' "'To be sure, stranger,' said the shepherd, "'and faith you've been lucky in choosing your time, for we are having a bit of a fling for a glad cause.' though, to be sure, a man could hardly wish that glad cause to happen more than once a year. "'Nor less,' spoke up a woman, "'for it is best to get your family over and done with as soon as you can, so as to be all the earlier out of the faglet.' "'And uh, what may be this uh, glad cause?' asked the stranger. A "'Birth and christening,' said the shepherd. The stranger hoped his host might not be made unhappy either by too many or too few of such episodes, and being invited by a gesture to a pull at the mug, he readily acquiesced. His manner, which before entering had been so dubious, was now altogether that of a careless and candid man. "'Late to be traipsing athwart the comb, eh?' said the engaged man of fifty. "'Late it is, master, as you say. I'll take a seat in the chimney-corner, if you have nothing to urge against it, ma'am, for I am a little moist on the side that was next the rain.' Mrs. Shepherd Fennel assented, and made room for the self-invited comer, who, having got completely inside the chimney-corner, stretched out his legs and arms, with the expansiveness of a person quite at home. "'Yes, I am rather cracked in the vamp,' he said freely, seeing that the eyes of the shepherd's wife fell upon his boots. "'And I am not well fitted, either. I have had some rough times lately, and have been forced to pick up what I can get in the way of wearing, but I must find a suit better fit for working days when I reach home.' "'One of hereabouts?' she inquired. Uh, "'Not quite that. Um, further up the country.' "'I thought so, and so be I. And by your tongue you come from my neighbourhood.' "'But you would hardly have heard of me,' he said quickly. Uh, "'My time would be long before yours, ma'am, you see.' The testimony to the youthfulness of his hostess had the effect of stopping her cross-examination. "'There is only one thing more wanted to make me happy,' continued the newcomer, "'and that is a little backy, which I am sorry to say I am out of.' "'I'll fill your pipe,' said the shepherd. "'I must ask you to lend me a pipe likewise.' "'A smoker and no pipe about ye?' "'I have dropped it somewhere on the road.' The shepherd filled and handed him a new clay pipe, saying as he did so, "'Hand me your baccy box. I'll fill that, too, now I am about it.' The man went through the movement of searching his pockets. "'Lost that, too,' said his entertainer, with some surprise. 
"'I'm afraid so,' said the man, with some confusion. "'Give it to me in a screw of paper.' Lighting his pipe at the candle, with a suction that drew the whole flame into the bowl, he resettled himself in the corner, and bent his looks upon the faint steam from his damp legs, as if he wished to say no more. Meanwhile the general body of guests had been taking little notice of this visitor, by reason of an absorbing discussion in which they were engaged with the band about a tune for the next dance. The matter being settled, they were about to stand up when an interruption came in the shape of another knock at the door. At sound of the same, the man in the chimney-corner took up the poker and began stirring the brands as if doing it thoroughly were the one aim of his existence, and a second time the shepherd said, walk in in a moment another man stood upon the straw-woven doormat he too was a stranger this individual was one of a type radically different from the first there was more of the commonplace in his manner and a certain jovial cosmopolitanism sat upon his features he was several years older than the first arrival his hair being slightly frosted his eyebrows bristly and his whiskers cut back from his cheeks. His face was rather full and flabby, and yet it was not altogether a face without power. A few grog blossoms marked the neighborhood of his nose. He flung back his long drab greatcoat, revealing that beneath it he wore a suit of cinder-gray shade throughout, large heavy seals of some metal or other that would take a polish, dangling from his fob, as his only personal ornament. Shaking the water-drops from his low-crowned glazed hat, he said, "'I must ask for a few minutes' shelter, comrades, or I shall be wetted to my skin before I get to Casterbridge.' "'Make yourself at home, master,' said the shepherd, perhaps a trifle less heartily than on the first occasion. Not that Fennel had the least tinge of niggardliness in his composition, but the room was far from large, spare chairs were not numerous, and damp companions were not altogether desirable at close quarters for the women and girls in their bright-coloured gowns. However, the second comer, after taking off his greatcoat, and hanging his hat on a nail in one of the ceiling-beams, as if he had been specially invited to put it there, advanced and sat down at the table. This had been pushed so closely into the chimney-corner, to give all available room to the dancers, that its inner edge grazed the elbow of the man who had ensconced himself by the fire, and thus the two strangers were brought into close companionship. They nodded to each other, by way of breaking the ice of unacquaintance, and the first stranger handed his neighbour the family mug, a huge vessel of brown ware, having its upper edge worn away like a threshold by the rub of whole generations of thirsty lips that had gone the way of all flesh, and bearing the following inscription burnt upon its rotund side in yellow letters, There is no fun until I come. The other man, nothing loath, raised the mug to his lips, and drank on, and on, and on, till a curious blueness overspread the countenance of the shepherd's wife, who had regarded with no little surprise the first stranger's free offer to the second of what did not belong to him to dispense. "'I knew it,' said the toper to the shepherd with much satisfaction. "'When I walked up your garden before coming in, and saw the hives all of a row, I said to myself, "'Where there's bees, there's honey, and where there's honey, there's mead.' "'But mead of such a truly comfortable sort as this, I really didn't expect to meet in my older days.' He took yet another pull at the mug till it assumed an ominous elevation. "'Glad you enjoy it,' said the shepherd warmly. "'It is goodish mead,' assented Mrs. Fennel, with an absence of enthusiasm, which seemed to say that it was possible to buy praise for one's cellar at too heavy a price. "'It is trouble enough to make, and really I hardly think we shall make any more. For honey sells well, and we ourselves can make shift with a drop of small mead and metheglin for common use from the comb-washings. "'Oh, but you never have the heart!' reproachfully cried the stranger in cinder-gray, after taking up the mug a third time and setting it down empty. "'I love mead when tis old like this, as I love to go to church a Sundays, or to relieve the needy any day of the week.' 
ha 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 said the man in the chimney corner who in spite of the taciturnity induced by the pipe of tobacco could not or would not refrain from this slight testimony to his comrade's humour now the old mead of those days brewed of the purest first year or maiden honey four pounds to the gallon with its due complement of white of eggs cinnamon ginger cloves mace rosemary yeast and processes of working bottling and cellaring tasted remarkably strong but it did not taste so strong as it actually was hence presently the stranger in cinder gray at the table moved by its creeping influence unbuttoned his waistcoat threw himself back in his chair spread his legs and made his presence felt in various ways well well as i say he resumed i am going to casterbridge and to casterbridge i must go i should have been almost there by this time but the rain drove me into your dwelling and i'm not sorry for it you don't live in casterbridge said the shepherd not as yet though i shortly mean to move there going to set up in trade perhaps no no said the shepherd's wife it is easy to see that the gentleman is rich and don't want to work at anything the cinder gray stranger paused as if to consider whether he would accept that definition of himself he presently rejected it by answering rich is not quite the word for me dame i do work and i must work and even if i only get to casterbridge by midnight i must begin work there at eight to-morrow morning yes het or wet blow or snow famine or sword me day's work to-morrow must be done poor man then in spite of seeming you be worse off than we replied the shepherd's wife tis the nature of me trade men and maidens tis the nature of my trade more than my poverty but really and truly i must up and off or i shan't get a lodging in the town however the speaker did not move and directly added there's time for one more draught of friendship before i go and i'd perform it at once if the mug were not dry here's a mug of small said mrs fennel small we call it though to be sure tis only the first wash of the combs no said the stranger disdainfully i won't spoil your first kindness by partaking of your second certainly not broke in fennel we don't increase and multiply every day and i'll fill the mug again he went away to the dark place under the stairs where the barrel stood the shepherdess followed him why should you do this she said reproachfully as soon as they were alone he's emptied it once though it held enough for ten people and now he's not contented with the small but must needs call for more the strong and a stranger unbeknown to any of us for my part i don't like the look of the man at all but he's in the house my honey and tis a wet night and a christening days it wants a cup of mead more or less there'll be plenty more next bee burning very well this time then she answered looking wistfully at the barrel but what is this man's calling and where is he one of that he should come in and join us like this i don't know i'll ask him again the catastrophe of having the mug drained dry at one pull by the stranger in cinder gray was effectually guarded against this time by mrs fennel she poured out his allowance in a small cup keeping the large one at a discreet distance from him when he had tossed off his portion the shepherd renewed his inquiry about the stranger's occupation the latter did not immediately reply and the man in the chimney corner with sudden demonstrativeness said anybody may know my trade i'm a wheelwright a very good trade for these parts said the shepherd and anybody may know mine if they've the sense to find it out said the stranger in cinder gray you might generally tell what a man is by its claws observed the hedge carpenter looking at his own hands my fingers be as full of thorns as an old pin-cushion is a pin's the hands of the man in the chimney corner instinctively sought the shade and he gazed into the fire as he resumed his pipe the man at the table took up the hedge carpenter's remark and added smartly two but the oddity of my trade is that instead of setting a mark upon me it sets a mark upon my customers 
No observation being offered by anybody in elucidation of this enigma, the shepherd's wife once more called for a song. The same obstacles presented themselves as at the former time. One had no voice, another had forgotten the first verse. The stranger at the table, whose soul had now risen to a good working temperature, relieved the difficulty by exclaiming that, to start the company, he would sing himself. Thrusting one thumb into the armhole of his waistcoat, he waved the other hand in the air, and with an extemporizing gaze at the shining sheep-crooks above the mantelpiece began, "'Oh, my trade, it is the rarest one, simple shepherds all. My trade is a sight to see, for my customers are tie, and I take them up on high, and waft them to a far country.' The room was silent when he had finished the verse, with one exception, that of the man in the chimney-corner, who at the singer's word, chorus, joined him in a deep bass voice of musical relish. "'I waft them to a far country!' Oliver Giles, John Pitcher, the dairyman, the parish clerk, the engaged man of fifty, the row of young women against the wall, seemed lost in thought not of the gayest kind. The shepherd looked meditatively on the ground, the shepherdess gazed keenly at the singer, and with some suspicion. She was doubting whether this stranger were merely singing an old song from recollection, or was composing one there and then for the occasion. All were as perplexed at the obscure revelation as the guests at Belshazzar's feast, except the man in the chimney-corner, who quietly said, the second verse, stranger, and smoked on. The singer thoroughly moistened himself from his lips inward, and went on with the next stanza as requested. My tools are but common ones, simple shepherds all. My tools are no sight to see. A little hemp and string, and a post whereon to swing, a rent of it set up for me. Shepherd Fennel glanced round. There was no longer any doubt that the stranger was answering his question rhythmically. The guests, one and all, started back with suppressed exclamations. The young woman engaged to the man of fifty fainted halfway, and would have proceeded, but finding him wanting in alacrity for catching her, she sat down trembling. "'Oh, he's the—' whispered the people in the background, mentioning the name of an ominous public officer. "'He's come to do it. Tis to be at Custombridge jail to-morrow.' the man for sheep-stealing. The poor clock-maker we heard of, who used to live away at Shotsford, and had no work to do. There must see Summers, whose family were a-starving, and so he went out of Shotsford by the high road, and took a sheep in open daylight, defying the farmer and the farmer's wife, and the farmer's lad, and every man-jack among em. He, and they nodded toward the stranger of the deadly trade, is come from up the country to do it, because there's not enough to do in his own county town, and he's got the place here now our own county man's dead. He's going to live in the same cottage under the prison wall. The stranger in Cinder Gray took no notice of this whispered string of observations, but again wetted his lips. Seeing that his friend in the chimney-corner was the only one who reciprocated his joviality in any way, he held out his cup toward that appreciative comrade, who also held out his own. They clinked together, the eyes of the rest of the room hanging upon the singer's actions. He parted his lips for the third verse, but at that moment another knock was audible upon the door. This time the knock was faint and hesitating. The company seemed scared. The shepherd looked with consternation toward the entrance, and it was with some effort that he resisted his alarmed wife's deprecatory glance, and uttered for the third time the welcoming words, "'Walk in!' The door was gently opened, and another man stood upon the mat. He, like those who had preceded him, was a stranger. This time it was a short, small personage of fair complexion, and dressed in a decent suit of dark clothes. "'Can you tell me the way to—' he began, when, gazing round the room, to observe the nature of the company among whom he had fallen, his eyes lighted on the stranger in cinder gray. It was just at the instant when the latter, who had thrown his mind into his song with such a will that he scarcely heeded the interruption, 
silenced all whispers and inquiries by bursting into his third verse the world of his be workin day simple shepherds all to-morrow is a workin day for me for the farmer sheep is slain and the lad who did it tain and on his soul may god have mercy the stranger in the chimney corner waving cups with the singer so heartily that his meads plashed over on the hearth repeated in his bass voice as before and on his soul may god have mercy all this time the third stranger had been standing in the doorway finding now that he did not come forward or go on speaking the guests particularly regarded him they noticed to their surprise that he stood before them the picture of abject terror his knees trembling his hands shaking so violently that the door latch by which he supported himself rattled audibly his white lips were parted and his eyes fixed on the merry officer of justice in the middle of the room a moment more and he had turned closed the door and fled what a man can it be said the shepherd the rest between the awfulness of their late discovery and the odd conduct of this third visitor looked as if they knew not what to think and said nothing instinctively they withdrew further and further from the grim gentleman in their midst whom some of them seemed to take for the prince of darkness himself till they formed a remote circle an empty space of floor being left between them and him Curculus cuius centrum diabolus the room was so silent though there were more than twenty people in it that nothing could be heard but the patter of the rain against the window shutters accompanied by the occasional hiss of a stray drop that fell down the chimney into the fire and the steady puffing of the man in the corner who had now resumed his pipe of long clay the stillness was unexpectedly broken the distant sound of a gun reverberated through the air apparently from the direction of the county town be jiggered cried the stranger who had sung the song jumping up what does that mean asked several a prisoner escaped from the jail that's what it means all listened the sound was repeated and none of them spoke but the man in the chimney corner who said quietly i've often been told that in this county they fire a gun at such times but i never heard it till now i wonder if it is my man murmured the personage in cinder gray surely it is said the shepherd involuntarily and surely we've seen him that little man who looked in at the door by now and quivered like a leaf when he zeed ye and heard your song his teeth chattered and the breath went out of his body said the dairyman and his heart seemed to sink within him like a stone said oliver giles and he bolted as if he'd been shot at said the hedge carpenter true his teeth chattered and his heart seemed to sink and he bolted as if he'd been shot at slowly summed up the man in the chimney corner i didn't notice it remarked the hangman we were all a-wondering what made him run off in such a fright faltered one of the women against the wall and now tis explained the firing of the alarm gun went on at intervals slow and sullenly and their suspicions became a certainty the sinister gentleman in cinder gray roused himself is there a constable here he asked in thick tones if so let him step forward the engaged man of fifty stepped quavering out from the wall his betrothed beginning to sob on the back of the chair you are a sworn constable i be sir then pursue the criminal at once with assistance and bring him back here he can't have gone far i will sir i will when i've got my staff i'll go home and get it and come sharp here and start in a body staff never mind your staff the man'll be gone but i can't do nothing without me staff can i william and john and charles jake no for there's the king's royal crown a-painted on it in yellow and gold and the lion and the unicorn so as when i raise it up and hit me prisoner tis made a lawful blow thereby i wouldn't tempt to take up a man without me staff no not i if i hadn't the law to give me courage why instead of my taking up him he might take up me now i'm the king's man myself and can give you authority enough for this said the formidable officer in grey now then olive be ready have you any lanterns yes have you any lanterns i demand it said the constable 
and the rest of you able-bodied able-bodied men yes the rest of ye said the constable have you some good stout staves and pitchforks staves and pitchforks in the name of the law and take em in their hands and go in quest and do as we in authority tell ye thus aroused the men prepared to give chase the evidence was indeed though circumstantial so convincing that but little argument was needed to show the shepherd's guests that after what they had seen it would look very much like connivance if they did not instantly pursue the unhappy third stranger who could not as yet have gone more than a few hundred yards over such uneven country a shepherd is always well provided with lanterns and lighting these hastily and with hurdle staves in their hands they poured out of the door taking a direction along the crest of the hill away from the town the rain having fortunately a little abated disturbed by the noise or possibly by unpleasant dreams of her baptism the child who had been christened began to cry heartbrokenly in the room overhead these notes of grief came down through the chinks of the floor to the ears of the women below who jumped up one by one and seemed glad of the excuse to ascend and comfort the baby for the incidents of the last half-hour greatly oppressed them thus in the space of two or three minutes the room on the ground floor was deserted quite but it was not for long hardly had the sound of footsteps died away when a man returned round the corner of the house from the direction the pursuers had taken peeping in at the door and seeing nobody there he entered leisurely it was the stranger of the chimney corner who had gone out with the rest the motive of his return was shown by his helping himself to a cut piece of skimmer cake that lay on a ledge beside where he had sat and which he had apparently forgotten to take with him he also poured out half a cup more mead from the quantity that remained ravenously eating and drinking these as he stood he had not finished when another figure came in just as quietly his friend in cinder gray oh you here said the latter smiling i thought you had gone to help in the capture and this speaker also revealed the object of his return by looking solicitously round for the fascinating mug of old mead and i thought you had gone said the other continuing his skimmer cake with some effort well on second thoughts i felt there were enough without me said the first confidentially and such a night as it is too besides tis the business of the government to take care of its criminals not mine uh, true so it is and i felt as you did that there were enough without me i don't want to break me limbs running over the humps and hollows of this wild country nor i neither between you and me these shepherd people are used to it simple-minded souls you know stirred up to anything in a moment they'll have him ready for me before the morning and no trouble to me at all they'll have him and we shall have saved ourselves all labour in the matter true true well uh, my way is to casterbridge and tis as much as my legs will do to take me that far going the same way oh no i'm sorry to say i have to get home over there he nodded indefinitely to the right and i feel as you do that it is quite enough for my legs to do before bedtime the other had by this time finished the mead in the mug after which shaking hands heartily at the door and wishing each other well they went their several ways in the meantime the company of pursuers had reached the end of the hog's back elevation which dominated this part of the down they had decided on no particular plan of action and finding that the man of the baleful trade was no longer in their company they seemed quite unable to form any such plan now they descended in all directions down the hill and straightway several of the party fell into the snare set by nature for all misguided midnight ramblers over this part of the cretaceous formation the lanchets or flint slopes which belted the escarpment at intervals of a dozen yards took the less cautious ones unawares and losing their footing on the rubbly steep they slid sharply downward the lanterns rolling from their hands to the bottom and there lying on their sides till the horn was scorched through when they had again gathered themselves together the shepherd as the man who knew the country best took the lead and guided them round these treacherous inclines the lanterns which seemed rather to dazzle their eyes and warn the fugitive than to assist them in the exploration were extinguished due silence was observed 
and in this more rational order they plunged into the vale. It was a grassy, briary, moist defile, affording some shelter to any person who had sought it, but the party perambulated it in vain, and ascended on the other side. Here they wandered apart, and after an interval closed together again to report progress. At the second time of closing in they found themselves near a lonely ash, the single tree on this part of the coombe, probably sown there by a passing bird some fifty years before. And here, standing a little to one side of the trunk, as motionless as the trunk itself, appeared the man they were in quest of, his outline being well defined against the sky beyond. The band noiselessly drew up and faced him. "'Your money or your life!' said the constable sternly to the still figure. "'No, no,' whispered John Pitcher. "'Tis at our side ought to say that. That's the doctrine of vagabonds like him, and we be on the side of the law.' "'Well, well,' replied the constable impatiently, "'I must say something, mustn't I? And if you had all the weight of this undertaken upon your mind, perhaps you'd say the wrong thing, too. "'Prisoner at the law, surrender in the name of the father—the uh, the crown, I mean.' The man under the tree seemed now to notice them for the first time, and, giving them no opportunity, whatever, for exhibiting their courage, he strolled slowly toward them. He was, indeed, the little man, the third stranger. But his trepidation had in a great measure gone. "'Well, travellers,' he said, "'did I hear you speak to me?' "'You did. You got to come and be our prisoner at once,' said the constable." We arrest thee on the charge of not biding in Casterbridge jail in a decent, proper manner to be hung to-morrow morning. Neighbours, do your duty, and seize the culprit. On hearing the charge, the man seemed enlightened, and, saying not another word, resigned himself with preternatural civility to the search-party, who, with their staves in their hands, surrounded him on all sides, and marched him back toward the shepherd's cottage. It was eleven o'clock by the time they arrived, the light shining from the open door, a sound of men's voices within, proclaimed to them as they approached the house that some new events had arisen in their absence. On entering they discovered the shepherd's living-room to be invaded by two officers from Casterbridge jail, and a well-known magistrate, who lived at the nearest country seat, intelligence of the escape having become generally circulated. "'Gentlemen,' said the constable, "'I have brought back your man, not without risk and danger, but every one must do his duty. He is inside this circle of able-bodied persons who have lent me useful aid considering their ignorance of crown work. Then bring forward your prisoner. And the third stranger was led to the light. Who is this? said one of the officials. The man, said the constable. Certainly not, said the turnkey, and the first corroborated his statement. But how can it be otherwise? asked the constable. Or why was he so terrified at sight of the singing instrument of the law who sat there? Here he related the strange behavior of the third stranger on entering the house during the hangman's song. "'Can't understand it,' said the officer coolly. "'All I know is that it is not the condemned man. He's quite a different character from this one, a gauntish fellow with uh, dark hair and eyes, a uh, rather good-looking, and with a musical bass voice.' that if you heard it once you'd never mistake as long as you lived. Why, stools, twas the man in the chimney-corner! Hey, what? said the magistrate, coming forward after inquiring particulars from the shepherd in the background. Haven't you got the man after all? Well, sir, said the constable, he's the man we were in search of, that's true, and yet he's uh, not the man we were in search of, for the man we were in search of was uh, not the man we wanted, sir, if you understand me every day way, for twas the man in the chimney-corner. A pretty kettle of fish altogether, said the magistrate. You had better start for the other man at once. The prisoner now spoke for the first time. The mention of the man in the chimney-corner seemed to have moved him as nothing else could do. Sir, said he, stepping forward to the magistrate, Take no more trouble about me. The time is come when I may as well speak. I have done nothing. My crime is that the condemned man is my brother. Early this afternoon I left home at Shotsford to trap it all the way to Casterbridge jail to bid him farewell. I was benighted and called here to rest and ask the way. When I opened the door, 
I saw before me the very man, my brother, that I thought to see in the condemned cell at Casterbridge. He was in this chimney corner, and jammed close to him, so that he could not have got out if he had tried, was the executioner who had come to take his life, singing a song about it, and not knowing that it was his victim who was close by, joining in to save appearances. My brother looked a glance of agony at me, and I know he meant, Don't reveal what you see, my life depends on it. I was so terror-struck that I could hardly stand, and not knowing what I did, I turned and hurried away. The narrator's manner and tone had the stamp of truth, and his story made a great impression on all around. "'And do you know where your brother is at the present time?' asked the magistrate. "'I do not. I have never seen him since I closed this door.' "'I can testify to that, for we've been between ye ever since,' said the constable. "'Where does he think to fly to? What is his occupation?' "'He's our watch and clock maker, sir.' "'He said it was a wheelwright, a wicked rogue,' said the constable. "'There's wheels of clocks and watches he meant, no doubt,' said Shepherd Fennel. "'I thought his hands were palish for his trade.' "'Well, it appears to me that nothing can be gained by retaining this poor man in custody,' said the magistrate. "'Your business lies with the other unquestionably.' And so the little man was released offhand. But he looked nothing the less sad on that account, it being beyond the power of magistrate or constable to raise out the written troubles in his brain, for they concerned another whom he regarded with more solicitude than himself.' When this was done, and the man had gone his way, the night was found to be so far advanced that it was deemed useless to renew the search before the next morning. Next day, accordingly, the quest for the clever sheep-stealer became general and keen, to all appearance, at least. But the intended punishment was cruelly disproportioned to the transgression, and the sympathy of a great many country folk in that district was strongly on the side of the fugitive. Moreover, his marvellous coolness and daring in hob and nobbing with the hangman, under the unprecedented circumstances of the shepherd's party, won their admiration, so that it may be questioned if all those who ostensibly made themselves so busy in exploring woods and fields and lanes were quite so thorough when it came to the private examination of their own lofts and outhouses. Stories were afloat of a mysterious figure being occasionally seen in some old overgrown trackway or other, remote from turnpike roads, but when a search was instituted in any of these suspected quarters, nobody was found. Thus the days and weeks passed without tidings. In brief, the bass-voiced man of the chimney-corner was never recaptured. Some said that he went across the sea, others that he did not, but buried himself in the depths of a populous city. At any rate, the gentleman in Cinder Gray never did his morning's work at Casterbridge, nor met anywhere at all, for business purposes, the genial comrade with whom he had passed an hour of relaxation in the lonely house on the coombe. The grass has long been green on the graves of Shepherd Fennel and his frugal wife. The guests who made up the christening party have mainly followed their entertainers to the tomb. The baby in whose honour they all had met is a matron in the sear and yellow leaf, but the arrival of the three strangers at the shepherds that night, and the details connected therewith, is a story as well known as ever in the country about higher crostairs. End of The Three Strangers by Thomas Hardy Read by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio